So, what with all the news about a star to guide us coming out uh, very shortly on the coming Tuesday, I thought I'd take the time for this release to do something I haven't done for ages. Remember before POF came out, we had a look at some of the Guild Wars 1 locations, what they were like in the original game to compare to and understand when we got to the expansion itself. Well, how about we do that again? I could have done it for Istan and stuff, but uh, since we have very express understanding of where will be the Jahai Bluffs on this next release, I thought this could be something fun to do. Now, if you've been watching all my content and coverage already, you'll know that on one of the recent videos, I kind of went to that Shaman's map and we did a bit of a comparison there. But in this video, I thought it might be fun to actually see the location, see the difference between the areas, and this means if you watch this as a Guild Wars 2 player who never played the original and you link it to people who never played the original, you'll hopefully get a lot more enjoyment out of the patch because I feel like that's a big thing, Path of Fire and Forwards. Uh, there's so much stuff that honors all the old things and you might feel a little bit left out. Well, hopefully a video like this might improve that somehow. So yeah, let's talk about things. Where am I right now? Well, the Sunspear Sanctuary. This is actually it in engine. I'm playing my Paragon. Before all of you ask in the comments as well, I am running a UI mod. Uh, this is Minimalis UI. You can find it on the Guild Wars 1 wiki. I'm also running the skill icon add-on that I mentioned in that other video recently that improves the resolution of all the skills. Anyway, so yeah, we are actually at the Sunspear Sanctuary. This is what we'll get next release for the Sun's Refuge. And all the media we've seen so far makes it look like the exact same thing. But I did just want to point out before we explore it, that as a Nightfall character, you actually originally unlocked this base of operations not from the Jahai Bluffs, but from here, the Marga Coast instead. So we sail across, we assault Gendara, the attack goes awry, we're spread everywhere, we travel from Yolan Haven seeking help, and we come to this little village here, Ronjok Village. Uh, this is the home of one of the heroes for this campaign, actually. And the elders and the people here do offer you refuge. Some of them aren't happy with it, some of them are a little bit more happy with it, uh, but basically they talk about the fact there's a cave system behind where they live, nestled away behind these plants and things, that all of the Cornan military are unlikely to find, as you can see here. And this is the original entrance to the Sunspear Sanctuary. Um, that guy complimenting us. So as we move through, this is kind of the cheesy thing I mentioned in that previous video. You kind of go through a loading screen and we warp a pretty considerable distance, really far underground. So all this area of the map, as I explained, is unexplored. And we can sort of check out the cave. The cave is pretty vast, but uh, what this might be like at the surface remains a mystery to this day. The reason I kind of wanted to point that out in this video here as well is that, frankly, I don't think we're going to get anywhere near the original cave entrance over here at the Marga Coast. Uh, if we're going to the Jahai Bluffs, and if they're going to get a lot of the other cool places, like the Chantry of Secrets and stuff, I just can't imagine the map extending this far along. You know, the Domain of Corner is only a size of, you know, this kind of box here. So, I don't know whether we'll see the original entrance. We'll probably see some of the other entrances, which I'll get into now. Uh, but yeah, this is the actual sanctuary. It's a huge cave with very little going on, frankly. There was a mini mission, a mini instance quest you had to do here on your first arrival, where you clear it out from grubs and spiders and just general insects and things that have come in over the years. I wonder if Guild Wars 2 will replicate such a thing, or the place has been kept comfy ever since the time of Cormir. And the Sun Spears that actually rebelled against the Cordons and prevented Nightfall. Maybe it's become something of a revered place. But back now in the timeline, 250 years ago, it was just full of insects and nasty stuff. You do clear it out and make it safe for your guys. Uh, and you get all these, like, fountains here, right? With the water, the cleansing waters. These uh, are various areas you had to purify in that mini instance. There's one here, one here. And you'll notice in some of those screenshots for a star to guide us, it looks like this kind of thing is back, except they're like fireplaces now. And maybe they're individual areas that we light up and, you know, we cast this big golden glow. You'll also notice there are some like trenches dug into the floor, maybe connecting them all. And I wonder how much uh, artistic liberty the devs will take with that. Uh, but yeah, originally, uh, for the first game, the big ticket item is this is a big chasm where there aren't really any NPCs standing around. You do a mini mission and then you never really look back at. Uh, we, of course, do get, because it's Guild Wars 1, area lore. So this is what it was uh, described as originally. Carved as a shrine to Melandru in ancient times. So this would be considered ancient times even 250 years ago. Uh, and the, the origins of the people who actually made this, who worship Melandru, we really don't know much about. Were they people from... 
way back when, uh, you know, around the same time that Farina was erected. The devs never explained. Uh, and they don't have to. You know, that mystery is one of the exciting things about the world. Uh, this red rocked vault was once used as a cistern by the Cornans to contain the Ellen's floodwaters. When that enterprise failed, the sanctuary was walled off and forgotten, inhabited only by things that like to live in the dark. Now it serves as a secret refuge for the Sun Spears. So one of the things that Nightfall did beautifully, especially around the Elona arc, is it kind of has this idea of this big river, the River Elon, that brings life to this region of the world. Uh, I guess it's kind of our version of the River Nile or something, right? So there were so many different stories about how the people here utilized the Elon, and this is just another little one. You can see maybe this small tributary that comes off here. And uh, yeah, that's why that big story of Joko damning it and starving everyone away was such a cool thing from the movement of the world that I don't know how much the sequels really touched on well enough just yet Especially considering look a lot of the Ellen and the Delta that it forms was around the Dejaran estate and stuff which was last patch uh, So hey, anyway, that's the Sunspear Sanctuary and really it covers such a vast area um, That we don't get to see because it's all behind these loading screens. So here's how it mechanically actually worked You got a few quests here from say Lonai um, and of course we have the cool living world stories to do with that recently if you've been following very closely Yeah, the henchmen, but not much going on the true magic happened here at the command post where I'm currently stood is like a Guild Wars 2 map any real world player could be wandering around here and when Nightfall originally released there would have been tons of people here because this was a big quest hub obviously the game's a decade old now and we don't see many but the magic happens when you come through this portal where I'm no longer in a regular kind of open world area if you will I'm now in my own little mini instance and it was actually the command post explorable area that was updating and changing constantly so you see all these NPCs now the smugglers I love the idea of these old buildings by the way and that we might add these I guess would have been like the waterworks before and the idea we could actually explore them in Guild Wars 2 the smugglers and the skill trader and the profession trader and my various heroes they all get added through doing side quests to actually build it up and this is the exact same kind of interaction and gameplay that we're likely to find in the Sun's Refuge in the sequel uh, of particular note is all the way over here too with this big old tent and you've got you know your armor smiths you've got your rune traders weapon smiths and so on and so on and so on uh, but the other thing from the command post was not just this or the fact that your heroes updated here and gave you different quests but also that there were lots of portals leaving from it so if I go through this portal here I'll end up in this map called Chirai's procession I'll just skip all the way up here and we'll be off so the question is Next release, a star to guide us, when we get the Sunspear Sanctuary and Command Post together, are we going to find a closed off gate or doorway to the north hinting at a map up in, you know, we're talking Kraukatorik's resting place now, 250 years in the future, that would take us to Churai's procession? Is it going to be locked until episode 4 is done and we move into episode 5? And then maybe we'll get another episode that unlocks another portal down here. So it really is kind of that same sense of a central location with lots of spokes coming off. Here you can see, uh, well that's a Chur Churai's Procession thing actually. I think maybe I was looking at the entrance to the Sunward Marches there. Churai's Procession is the next one. And over here is kind of the big one that we're really looking forward to. The Jahai Bluffs. So as you can see, we entered from the Marga Coast and through two uh, portals we kind of move this vast territory now out into the Jahai Bluffs and not just the Jahai Bluffs but kind of the middle of the Jahai Bluffs too so this bridge here that you just saw I walked through like on the loading screen that's what I'm wondering if how Guild Wars 2 will do this entrance to the cave this could be the entrance we'll see upcoming on Tuesday and it's near some phenomenal landmarks uh, notably of course the monument to the defeat of Palawa Joko, which also happens to be a monument built over his tomb. So I'll show you exactly how this looks. My gut is that maybe at some point in the patch, having just defeated Joko, uh, Dragon's Watch will get together and say, all right, what should we do? Uh, and maybe somehow we'll be led to his tomb based on the fallout of his defeat. But here it is. You've got this uh, face here. I guess it kind of represents him. The, interesting enough, there was another quest that took place here that where you spawned a titan at this monument, if I remember rightly, which is really strange. The idea that a titan was being held captive here near Joko. I doubt that Guild Wars 2 will touch on that story too much, though that would make me quite giddy. Uh, but yeah, this is a kind of an ominous looking landmark, which we can interact with. 
Let me flag my heroes over there. So it says, this monument commemorates the defeat of Palawa Joko at the Battle of Jahai. So remember, we're at a place called the Jahai Bluffs, where he was defeated initially by Churayosa on his original invasion attempt, ages before even Guild Wars 1, was here. It was just north on those cliffs above us at the Grand Cataract. In fact, one of the Nightfall cutscenes shows some of our NPC allies standing up there. So it's sort of vaguely playable terrain, but you can't really go there without the bonus mission pack. Um, but so he was defeated in this area of the world and entombed and commemorated in this area of the world. After 100 days of bloody battle, Churai Osa and his elite troops defeated Joko's undead forces of grey giants and undead centaurs. Uh, yet, despite attempts made with magic, blade, and even darker means, Palawa Joko could not be killed. Chirai Osa's elite forces chained him by magic and bound him deep in the earth. Thus, the Undead Lord's defeat was complete, and Palawa Joko sealed away forever in a location kept secret by the Order of Whispers. Now, you notice this text doesn't explicitly say that he's buried here, uh, but the Nightfall manuscripts have this description of Palawa. They say his body is said to have been imprisoned beneath a huge stone plinth, which we could interpret this as. And during the main story, when the realms of Tyria and the realm of Torment start blending together, as we stand here, we watch Palawa get freed by these activities of Abaddon. It's kind of a mistaken belief in the community that the hero of Guild Wars 1 freed Palawa. That's not true. The hero of Guild Wars 1 helped Palawa out after he was freed because of the two realms coming together. And it just so happens that it was the same location here, by the way, that as Palawa breaks free, Cormir... Uh, actually is imprisoned in the realm of torment herself and we've kind of just followed Joko as he runs off to the desolation through Chirai's procession. So a lot of big things happened here uh, right at this monument not even including side quests. This is the last place that a living Cormir was actually seen on Tyria. Blinded, crippled as she now was after she disappears from this location she's trapped in one of the afterlives kicking ass still to be honest but and then eventually becoming a god this was where she ceased to be as a mortal on this plane you'd think maybe the sun spears would care about that a lot of humans even and you know this would be a really interesting cool place for the devs to take us to right in the next patch and oh guess what there's a cave nearby where maybe we can start rebuilding the sun spears and doing good stuff i'll note as well if you remember this is supposedly branded now up here I really hope we get to go underground and see the tomb intact, but maybe it's all crystalline and just branded and horrible there nonetheless. Uh, so yes, that's probably the biggest thing from Jahai Bluffs. Obviously, because we can't go to the uh, Grand uh, Grand Cataract and the bonus mission thing right here. Uh, but I do want to show you some other stuff. That's the main garrison. I'm expecting that place to look and feel and play a lot like last patch did, where it will be full of Awakened with the other garrison, and we maybe have to take it out. Perhaps not through such stealthy means this time. Maybe we'll go in there, guns blazing. Uh, who knows how many forces we have around right now since um, Blish vowed not to use any more of those portals. Uh, so yeah, you've got that. There's more things to the south as well. There's lots of Mandragor spawns. There's some little centaur related things, if I remember rightly. But most of the great stuff is on the north of the map. So let's follow along over here to even more big, big strongholds and buildings. And this is the really cool one that I want to talk about. Let's get a bit closer. I'll take these insects out and see you guys in a second. So you'll notice uh, as we run now that the map in the original game was pretty flat, pretty open. You know, I think it would be wrong for me or anyone else when we get there on Tuesday if it's very flat and open uh, to kind of criticize Guild Wars 2 for that because it was pretty barren here in the original. Uh, and this seems sort of perfect for roller beetles, right? I know that there's no way we could get a roller beetle in the original game, but I just feel so tempted to glide around on these big hills and see how that feels, especially with the new endurance. Um, of course, this could all be branded as well at this point. But uh, yeah, if you look over here, there's a massive, massive, massive monument. Now, what this is, is the Fortress of Jahai. This is probably, the aside from Gandhara, the Moon Fortress, the biggest military stronghold and fortress you find the Kornans have 250 years ago. Uh, you can go quite deep in there. If you look at my compass up there right now, you'll see that there's a lot of hostile enemies. So it's a real slog to go through. And what the devs are trying to telegraph, basically, is, hey don't go here. This is too dangerous. If you do manage to kill everything up there, there's like a, a buried chest you can maybe get, uh, but the door is locked. In lore, in universe, it's an official like way to get up to Vabi. It takes you to this place beyond the attendee caverns and you get to continue going. 
but in the game, we're not allowed because we're at odds with the military of corner. And so we have to sneakily go through the Badok Caverns and we go on a bit of a, a side quest to get around it. So in Guild Wars 2, I'm really looking forward to being able to, especially with all the mountains and stuff, just climb around, make that place my own and see whether the devs have added interiors and all that good stuff over there. Another cool thought is the attendee canyons on the other sides. They were enormous cliffs and you were just winding your way between them. If in Guild Wars 2, because of my Springer and my uh, Griffin and stuff, I can now explore the flats way above. That's like giving the same area of the world, but again, doubling the playable terrain. Be cool to see how the devs do that and recreate that epic sense of scale, even in Guild Wars 2, where they struggle so much more to deliver it. I'll also note that you could find an alternate Nightfallen version of this garrison when you go to the Realm of Torment at the end of the campaign, but uh, obviously there's no reason to believe that will rear its head in this patch, right? Uh, so, yeah, I'm expecting Jahai Bluffs will give us all of that. Uh, now let's talk a little bit about the floodplain of Mankellen and the Mankellen Waterworks. Uh, perhaps I can show you it easily from the Modoc Crevice uh, outpost here. So this is where we enter the cave, the Badoc Caverns. I don't know where the next patch will give us all this this terrain. The only tip-off I feel is worthwhile right now is that there was that uh, documented change on the world map to the waterworks a bit back, suggesting there could be a map here, but I'm not entirely sure. Again, it's another big, uh, well-policed area that they, uh, you know, have various dams and filtration s s set up on the river Elon as it flows through. You might be able to get a bit of lore here, uh, perhaps at the Ryland Refuge, let's see. Located high above the banks of the Ellen River, this refuge is used by the nearby villagers and workers as a temporary camp. When the Ellen River overflows its banks every spring to give life back to the fertile plains, the residents of the surrounding area retreat here until the floods have subsided and the land is restored once more. There's no reason to believe that the people, even awakened as they are, uh, in this area of the world wouldn't still do something similar. Unless, I guess, the needs of the Awakened in terms of food are very different. Uh, but yes, I'm not as sure about this, but this is the other big thing I want to show you guys. The Chantry of Secrets, obviously. This has got to be in the map, right? This is such a brilliant location that I've been wanting for so long. Uh, where do we start with this? Well, first of all, this was a hub outpost to give people access to endgame. The best comparison I can make for very casual Guild Wars 2 only players who might be watching me right now is you can think of this place as an aerodrome. This is like one of the Guild Wars 1 aero Lion's Arch aerodromes, right? Each campaign had one. There was one in Canther, there was one in... Uh, prophecies and there was one here in nightfall what you could do is kneel to these statues of the gods such as the balthazar one here i don't know whether it will work because i don't know where, whether we have favor right now or how that even works for the game right now and i'm even messing up the emote let's see you would kneel at a statue here you go a envoy of the god would appear you would pay them money and you would enter an elite end game instance and you could go farm it this one in this case the fissure of woe if i did it at the grenth one i'd get to go to the guild wars one underworld uh, so that's what it kind of functioned as in terms of a gameplay mechanic, uh, which made it prominent. You know, a lot of players would be around here. A lot of players would have memories of it. In theory, the truth is a lot of us who were here also owned prophecies and we tended to use the Temple of the Aegis over there instead. Uh, so that was one. In, in the main campaign, though, this was also very important. This was the original Chantry. Let's listen. The Order of Whispers tends the home of the statues of the five true gods while also using the Chantry as their base of operations. A secretive order. They welcome visitors, but do not share much in the way of information. The order as we knew them 250 years ago were very different to the order as we know them now. They weren't splintered into two different organizations, Order of Shadows and Whispers. There was no Order of Shadows back at this point in the timeline. Uh, and they were more like demon hunting oriented than pure stealth and uh, sabotage kind of thing and subterfuge. But they were based out of a place called the Chantry. So essentially what happens, guys, is into over the next 250 years, the people who are here and name this their headquarters fracture in two. Some of them continue focusing on domestic stories. Some of them realize the Elder Dragons are a bit of an issue and want to look at Cortarian problems, and they go north. The ones that went north continued to call themselves the Order of Whispers. The ones that stayed called themselves the Order of Shadows. What of the new Chantry then? Will we finally get the story as to why they, you know, listed a whole new one there? Was this one leveled? What happened in those 250 years? Is it still there? How does it compare to the Order of Shadows activities in the Darklands now that we got in the Path of Fire expansion? These are all questions I'm desperate to know the answer to. And also, you know, the statues too. 
uh, just to be clear, the last time we got one of these aerodromes, the Temple of the Ages, that's God's Lost Swamp, where the Shadow Behemoth spawns. A really awesome world boss, and it's all flooded and underwater. God's Lost Swamp, to me, is one of the coolest examples of seeing a Guild Wars 1 iconic location reimagined into the sequel. And here, for the first time since launch of Vanilla 2012, we get that again. Will this one be flooded too? Who knows? A final extra little thing as well was this gate here uh, with this Guardian of Whispers. And you could never go behind this gate your first time visiting this location in the campaign. But on return to this location, you could speak to this dude and he would say, the area behind these doors... Uh, is not ready for public access, and we could say, ah, but I would like to pay my respects to the new god, Cormir. And you just heard the five true gods in the outpost description there. Well, don't forget, at the end of Nightfall, a new god is birthed into the world. And the devs added that to this location. Check it out, there is a final new statue, and this is the first depiction of Cormir in statue form we ever had. This is her actually holding up Abaddon's cowl, his head, right? And she's got her book. Uh, and you got our inscription here. This was the first time we got to read this. And so it came to pass... You'll read this multiple times in Guild Wars 2. And so it came to pass that Spear Marshal Cormir, hero of all Elona, was pulled into the inky blackness surrounding the God of Secrets. And though her sight had been robbed, her body racked, and her spirit flayed, she remained resolute. And so was she joined within the realm of torment by fearless allies. The blood of Elonia, that's my name's ca my character's name, and other great heroes who stood at her side as she sought to thwart Nightfall. Together did they battle through fear and anguish, madness, until they at last stood before the face of the imprisoned god. He who had once challenged the five and lost. He who had threatened to break the chains placed upon him by the other gods. He who now sought to bring Nightfall to the world. The dark god, Abaddon. And so did Cormir and her allies engaged the dark god in titanic battle and through her power and their combined skin and bravery and the blessing of the five true gods did abaddon at last face his ultimate defeat yet the power of a god cannot be destroyed and cormir making the choice that only a mortal could make did take upon herself the mantle of the goddess of truth with all its power and responsibility all its dominion and duties and so by mortal hands did a new immortal enter creation and obviously, Cormier had a lot to do with the Path of Fire story. This isn't where that happened, but this is where that information was first being detailed and logged and shared. And so when you play Ascalon Catacombs in Guild Wars 2, 250 years later, and you find a statue of Cormier in there, you know, the people who did that will have looked at this place as inspiration. So here's the question. What has Joko done with this in the meantime? Has the Order managed to keep Joko's forces away? Was this all managed to keep a secret? Uh, and just like the other statues as well, by the way, we could kneel here and the gods would come and we could get to this end game area, the Seer of Truth. This is Cormier's avatar, one of the rare opportunities you get to interact with it. She takes you, it costs no money this time, to uh, the, realm, the Domain of Anguish, the elite area for Nightfall. So, will we see hints at all this stuff? Will we see another Shadow Behemoth? I mean, we know we've got a confirmed new Shatterer, right? It looks a little bit smaller. But could they do another thing because this was kind of close to the other realms? Ah, it's got to be in this patch. I'll be really hyped if it is. It's just north of the Fortress of Jahai. And, uh, yeah, maybe we get a bit of Churai's Procession. But, uh, you know, I'm sure that there'll be more opportunity to look at this and where the borders of the Desolation are with other maps in the future. And, yeah, there you go, guys. That is, uh, realistically, what we get. The Codner Crossroads is where maybe... The last episode could connect with a new one. Kodna Crossroads. At the crossroads of Kadna, uh, no one will speak ill of War Marshal Varesh. Her right control over trade has made the merchants here rich. Come for bargains, stay for the excellent security measures. Just don't get too rowdy or you may find yourself on the receiving end of Varish's famed law and order. Uh, so there is this area and maybe this will sort of be reimagined in some cool way. The rest, the devs kind of have an open playground, right? They have got an open field to do what they like with. This is what it looked like in Guild Wars 1. Remember this video, enjoy this video, and make sure the people you want to really enjoy the game watch this video so that when the patch comes out, you can kind of actually resolve some of these differences and uh, increase your enjoyment, hopefully. Let me know if you guys still like this kind of production. If you do, I can easily uh, crack some of these out for the upcoming maps as well. I do regret not having them done for Istan, but I guess it depends on the viewership and all that kind of stuff. Boring, 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 I know. So yeah, cheers guys. Hope you enjoyed. I'll be back very soon. I've got a big announcement as well for a cool project I'm going to be doing on patch day. Stay tuned for that. Uh, it should be very, very cool. Thanks guys. I'll see you next time.